Scott made a promise to you last week that he said, Josh will explain the Nephilim. How many of you guys were here last night and remember him saying I would do this? Any of you? Okay, a few of you, so here we go. In researching the Hebrew word, the Nephilim, we're going to jump right into thick uh, content. The prefix uh, actually refers to the late 19th century, and the last half of the word connects to uh, this word cornhusker. And so you can decide, yeah, you guys are awake, made the connection. All right, perfect. So you can let Scott know that I completely explained who those amazing individuals were, and uh, he will get a kick out of that. Uh, In this Dust to Dust series, we're talking about the flood today. And it got me thinking about uh, when I was preparing uh, my home to receive my firstborn, uh, we had one room that was like this pastel purple, had carpet that kind of matched. My wife loved precious moments. Man, we're going to do Noah's Ark precious moments like, like any Bible-believing family would. And I've been thinking about this, you guys, in preparation for this message, thinking about what I put in my uh, kids' room. Like they had this little light up arc with lights and like little figurines. It was on the curtains. I mean, it may have been on his blankets. I can't, I've got a bad memory and it's been almost two decades. But I think to myself, hey child, death and destruction for all of humanity rest well tonight. <laughs> right? Why, why would we do that? Like, hey, God's judgment, horrific, like literally the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of mankind, and we're going to paste your room with it so you can sleep comfortably at night. I don't know why we do this to our kids, but we do. Well, I guess if you had it arranged correctly where it was the animals coming out of the boat, then maybe you could fight for what that should look like. But anyways, um, just in case you weren't here last week, before we jump into the flood, we have to revisit a piece of what Scott talked about last week so that as we see God's judgment, as we see God's salvation and Noah's faith and obedience, we don't forget the why behind it. Verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. Whenever I was writing any paper for any college class, they said, be careful with using absolute words because you're making a big statement if you use them. And those are the words that are chosen here. Every every inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all of the time. That is how bad things have become. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. I think of a, a parent that looks at a situation and goes, I had so much more thoughts and dreams, and I thought the story would be written differently when it comes to my kids, my nephews, the next generation behind me, and I'm grieved for what it's become. I think of maybe what my parents, my grandparents, as they look at my generation or the generation after me, and they go, man, what has happened to humanity. Like I think of that type of mindset, and God had the privilege, being God, that he could push reset So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men, animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved. You're hearing that word again. I am grieved that I have made them. But then, verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Based on how he was living, he was living Uh, in a way that was contradictory to his culture. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Not salvation, but he found favor. And this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He was not righteous and blameless in comparison to God. He was righteous and blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Think about the condition of Noah. We have the plate has been set. God has said, this is not a reset. Hear me in this. He does not start completely over because sin existed in the world here. Sin existed after the flood. So it wasn't a hard reset. I would like to look at this more as a rebirth. Um, 
in verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, God approaches Noah and gives him the blueprint for what is going to happen to some extent. We don't know how far into detail he gets. This is what we get. I am going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And then he starts to get some specific instructions, but not too specific from God in how he is going to provide salvation for Noah and his family. Verse 14, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. I can't imagine, I would have hated the sticky feet of doing that. That's beside the point. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Because we're a football culture, football field and a half, almost as wide as a football field, and almost as twice as tall as, a, uh, as your like generic power pole. So you picture how big this boat was, okay? And, and for perspective, during his time and day, Noah's, people in Noah's time would not be familiar with these Caribbean cruise-sized ships. They would have had like maybe small little skiffs to cruise around in the shallows to hunt and gather and to do some things like this. And if they were adventurous enough to actually have a, a seafaring vessel, they would never venture out further than to where they could see the land. So you can imagine Noah building this massive ark, right? Just totally, uh, you can imagine how the people would have looked at him. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters to the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. You're hearing it, destroying all life. Every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring to the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away for you and them. And then the next verse, verse 22, amazes me. Noah did everything just as God had commanded. I have all kinds of questions up to this point. Was Noah an engineer? He was called to build a cruise ship with, with like these manual tools. Imagine this. It's not like he had a lathe. It's not like he had a, a planer. It's not like he had table saws and radial arm saws power nailers, and like a nice like spray coat to waterproof things. He didn't have any of this. And he was called to build a boat of this magnitude. And not only a boat of this magnitude, he was called, I don't know if he had a zoology degree, I'm guessing he didn't, care for these animals inside this vessel. I have all kinds of questions. The shape of this vessel, when the floodwaters came, how in the world did it not tumble how in the world did, did, he, did he remain safe? Because later in the scripture, it talks about the floodwaters that actually come. For 40 days and 40 nights, it says the earth opened up and floodwaters rushed forth. And, and the rain came down for 40 days and 40 nights. And our part of the country, more than most right now, understand the impact of flood, right? We've had a rough year. Every time we see forecasted, like all last summer, any time that any rain was coming, I guarantee people were like, man, not again. But 40 days, 40 nights, the, the waters rose, it said, above the peaks of mountains. You can imagine being in a boat for, for that length of time, but sometimes we forget it was longer than just the 40 days and 40 nights. It says that to conclude the waters receding, the land drying up, Noah and all of these animals and his family were in this ship for over a year. Talk about cabin. We get, we get anxious this time of year to get outside, right? 
You imagine being in a boat for a year? I have all kinds of questions. How did he have enough food for himself and the animals? How did the food keep from spoiling? What happened when the animals ate the food and then you had animal byproducts? How did you get that out of the boat? How do you keep the lions from eating the sheep? Was it genus and species, or was it simply like classes and order of animals? Who was in that boat? Because I'm like looking at the size of it, and I'm looking at how many animals exist on our planet now, and I'm asking, was that different? When these floodwaters came up, how did that ship stay together? Like, un- like unless he was just a wizard of an engineer, how did he get that done? How did he make sure it didn't leak? Did light get in? Were they in darkness for that amount of time? What did that look like? I've got all of these questions and I realize, you guys, I could get caught in the details. And I'm going to miss the bigger picture of the story of Scripture. I'm going to miss the bigger picture of the story of the flood because the bigger picture of Scripture is simply this. It's, scripture tells the story of God's redemptive plan. For mankind. If it was like a movie thing, it would say, God's redemptive plan for mankind. And then there would be a subline that would go, Because you can't do it on your own. That's what it would look like. And that's the same with this story. Because God is a righteous God, the story of Noah is about God's judgment. We worship a God that when injustice is done, God says, I will take care of that when the time is right. And with the flood, the time was right. Injustice was all over the earth. And he said the time was right. The story of Noah is about salvation. Salvation that came honestly through the flood. Because God wanted to, wanted to provide a new, a new plan for humanity through Noah and his family. And he knew that salvation was going to come for all of humanity through this family, through the ark. And that gives me part of the answer of what happened to this boat because Scripture says that as the floodwaters rose and the waters raged and everything tossed and turned, God remembered Noah in the ark. He was caring for them because I'm trying to think of how that ship was not torn apart. How did that ship not get thrown against a mountain range? How did that ship not spin a couple times by a giant wave and like you imagine elephants falling on a zebra and like what like I can't again I can't get caught in those details because that's not the bigger picture it's God's judgment God's salvation Abraham's faithfulness in obedience Noah did everything just as God commanded him he gathered animals animals were brought to him he brought food God shut him in Noah was obedient he wasn't perfect Noah was a sinful man, but he found favor in God's eyes, and God chose him and his family. God shut him in and provided salvation. And here's what I love about the story of Noah and what I love about Scripture and what I love about going through Genesis. Third City, all of these stories, all of this history, all of God's provision points towards Christ, points towards us. And points towards salvation. Like I think about Noah's faith and Noah's obedience. He was was living in a countercultural way. The idea of building a boat, the idea of being an honorable man, not a perfect man, but the idea of being righteous and blameless was countercultural in his day. Can you relate to that? As someone trying to walk with Jesus, as someone trying to live differently than the, the culture around them, I'm asking, could you, can you relate to where Noah was at in this? And when it comes to being relentless, it says that it may have taken 100 or, or maybe 120 years for Noah to build this boat. Can you imagine getting up every day? It's like those old, some of you remember the Dunkin' Donut commercials, time to make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. You can search it on YouTube if you want. Dunkin' Donuts, time to make the donuts. You'll get what I'm saying. Noah getting up every day. Time to build the ark. Time to build the ark. Time to build the ark. Being relentless when he felt like there was no end in sight. I think about our circumstance. Like, does it feel relentless? Is there no end in sight? 
we get up every day and God is calling us to live by faith and to live in obedience. And then the last part of Noah's faith being even when he doesn't fully understand. I think about his story. All those people that died, I want you to think about this for a minute. I don't think Noah was probably pointing fingers and going, you're getting what you deserve. I think there were relatives, there were friends, there were people that he had done life with, that he probably had meals with, that when that flood came, he knew what it meant for them. And it would be hard because we're human to understand why. So even when we don't understand why, choosing to live by faith and obedience, and all of this points clearly to New Testament, to the gospel, to Jesus coming and saying, look, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Be aware, judgment is coming. And it's going to come for all of humanity. But listen, salvation is here. And Jesus could point at himself and go, salvation is here. And then you look at the story of faith and obedience in the church over the course of time. And it's kind of mirroring this bit of Noah, right? The church has always been countercultural. The church of Jesus' time was or excuse me, the culture of Jesus' time was very oppressive. The culture of Jesus' time uh, was very harsh and was very worldly. But then you have the church that was trying to be countercultural. And we're going to turn into 1 Peter chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we find this section of Scripture where, where this, this guy Peter was writing a letter of encouragement to a church and saying, hey, I get it. I know that times are tough. I know that it's hard to understand. I know that persecution exists. But I want to challenge you to live live your life of faith and obedience. Be consistent. Don't give up. You see, this, this letter that Peter wrote was probably during the time of Nero's reign in ancient Rome, and Nero uh, was a guy that that really wanted to push his own agenda, and when he had things that he wanted to do, was always looking for a scapegoat. He used Christians as that scapegoat, and and things that were happening in his day to those scapegoats was uh, people were being thrown in prison, families were being ripped apart, Christians were being thrown into the the, the Colosseum and ripped apart by wild animals. They're being drawn and quartered. Scripture says that they're being sawn in two. Uh, scripture says that they were, Nero would sometimes even place Christians on posts and light them on fire so that it could light, provide light for his games. You want to think that our day and age is hard. This letter is going to those Christians. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read a piece of verse 1 before we get or uh, verse 8 before we get to the part that's going to be on the screen. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. This is Peter's letter to the church. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. We're going to hear some love unlimited coming through these words. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Jumping over to verse 13, it says, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do, to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed if that happens. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. He's trying to affirm their continued obedience, uh, their continued obedience through faith. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. He's saying, be ready with your story. Your story of how Christ has made a difference in your life. And he said, be ready to share that story, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do this and be love unlimited as you do it. With gentleness and respect. 
I think about Noah and how he needed to be ready. I think about us as the church. And in the same way, we are called to live by faith and obedience in a culture that doesn't agree with Scripture. And sometimes when it seems like the end is far off and we're exhausted and we are tired and we want to know, God, when will, we, when will the injustice be over? I am exhausted. I am tired of laboring. I am tired. Even when we don't see the end, God is saying, be faithful in obedience. And finally, even when we don't understand, when we can't explain the why, God is saying, trust in me. You see, salvation came to Noah and to humanity through the flood. And in the same manner, Peter writes this. Writes this in chapter 3. I want to read this together because this is a powerful section of scripture. He's talking about the ark and how salvation came to Noah and his family. And he said, in that ark, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge. That word pledge uh, translates to like a step towards a contract, towards a covenant. And like the covenant and the contract cannot be possible unless the pledge is made. And it's, it's comparing that baptism as a pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ not by anything that you've done. You are saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Salvation coming through water. We're going to step in this moment of communion where we get to recognize God's salvation for us. We need to remember that his judgment that's coming, his salvation that's been provided, and the faith and obedience that his heart desires from his people. So let's, let's pray together as we step into this moment together as a church. Father, this moment of communion is so precious. It is so important that we do not forget. Thank you, Father, for being a righteous God that promises to rightly, justly judge. Father, thank you for also being a God that in the midst of the pain of that judgment, you have provided salvation. Lord, as we approach this table, this bread and this cup, challenge us, Lord to live by obedience through faith. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We, we have to remember that the flood was not about a hard reset. Sin existed beforehand. Sin existed afterwards. In fact, there's Scripture speaks to Noah getting drunk and naked after he left the ark. I'm not making that up for humor. Like, sin existed before. Sin existed afterwards. But after they came down, God made a promise to Noah. And he used something visual and something that would connect to communicate that promise, and it was a rainbow. And the, the word, he said, when you see this, this in the sky, it should remind you of, of the judgment, the salvation, and the fact that I will never judge all of humanity in this manner again. And that shape of a bow, like everywhere else in scripture that it's used, is referring to a military weapon of a bow that normally a conquering king would extend or a general would extend a bow, string first towards his enemies saying, look, it's done. I'm, I'm not going here anymore. You need to know this, you're safe. And so in the same way in the New Testament, we see another object that was used for death 
and violence, the cross. And God's saying in a similar manner, I'm going to be judging differently now. Salvation, when you see this cross that was meant for death and, and, and torture, you should look at it differently. You should remember that I'm going to judge differently and salvation is offered. I want you to walk in faith and obedience. And in the same way, sin existed before the cross, sin exists after the cross for you and me. God is looking for faithful obedience, just like Noah, just like the early church. Will you move in that manner?